Um, is God actually interested in every part of your life? Or does he only care about the times when you're in rooms like this, singing songs like we sang and listening to scriptures like we will touch on today? For lots of people, we never really have tried to integrate our interior life with our exterior life. Uh, we seem to go through with this kind of bifurcated reality, not quite a split personality, but trying to keep our feet in two very separate worlds. And so some people think that uh, this is something that is just a part of life. Uh, there's parts that are sacred and there's parts that are secular. And so uh, church is sacred and work is secular. A wedding is sacred. It's kind of a religious feature to that. And, and, and the marriage is secular. Prayer, conversation with God, sacred. Conversation with friends, secular. Um, the question I would ask is if we're keeping things separate like that, who are we trying to protect? Who are we trying to protect? The truth is that God cares about all the parts of our lives. It's natural for us to focus on the exterior. Uh, some of us didn't take much time in front of the mirror this morning. Uh, you know who you are, and we can tell. Uh, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of obvious. And, and some of you uh, spend a lot of time in front of the mirror, and you know who you are, and we can tell that too. What cracks me up is there are some people who, who will, will arrange their hair to make it look like it's bedhead. Like, that's what I try to get rid of in the morning. You don't want to see me look, that's not cool look on me. That looks very, very bad. Uh, but there's this idea that we pay attention to the exterior life, and sometimes we even think that if our exterior life is going poorly, it means our interior life is unhealthy. And this is actually a very old and a very pagan idea. It's not something that scripture teaches and it's not something that Christ teaches, but it is something that we find ourselves falling into. So the question is, if God cares about all the parts of our lives, how does he actually bring change to all the parts of our lives? And the simple truth is that some of us are not so sure we want God to change some things. When you walked in this morning, are you really open to God dealing with whatever area of your life he wants to? Or are there some places that you would prefer he would leave alone? You're afraid of what he might do in that area. And when it comes to change, we wish it were instantaneous. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you prayed one prayer and you went from being this flawed, broken human being to becoming this fully transformed child of God that just always got everything right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. So why doesn't it happen that way? Are there areas you wish God would leave alone and are you frustrated by how long it takes to experience change? This is what I believe is I believe that God has a path that you can walk that you may not find on your own or choose on your own. That what God calls us to is a process of change that is two things, slow and steady. Slow and steady. We're going to look at an interesting passage of scripture and it creates some conflict for us when we read it. You'll probably notice by the time we get to the end of the passage. It's in Exodus chapter 34 and it says, Moses chiseled out two stone tablets, like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning. And as, as the Lord had commanded him, and he carried the two stone tablets in his hands, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, now this is God talking now, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. What does that mean and why is that okay? It's a good question. 
Have you ever lost something? I know you have, your keys, a pen, uh, something. Uh, I have a story where I, I lost some AirPods. And uh, these are not inexpensive things, and, and uh, I can tell you how I lost them. I didn't know I lost them at the time. I was on my way to a, a wedding, and I was uh, driving. I was a little bit behind schedule, and everybody gets anxious when the pastor shows up late at a wedding. And so I'm, I'm driving maybe a little faster than I, I, I should be. And I remember hearing this noise on the top of the car. And, and I, I looked at my wife and I said, what was that? And I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw what looked like two stones spinning on the ground but they were white, and I thought that was really odd. And about five minutes later, it occurred to me, oh, I left my AirPods on the top of the car, and now. So I couldn't stop. I was already late. I went to the wedding. We stayed for the reception, and on my way back, I thought I, thought I might be able to find them. I did find them. Ha! <laughs> and they were destroyed. It turns out the AirPods, even in their case, coming off the top of a car at 50 miles an hour, do not survive the experience. I had to go back the way that I came. I had to retrace my steps to be able to find those things. And, and we understand this. Where was, where was the last time you saw it? We go back there and, and then we work our way forward from there. Even if you go to a doctor, like this is the thing that doctors will do, right? They don't just ask what you are feeling or what is wrong. They will start asking when questions. When did you notice this? They're trying to go back and retrace some steps to see what might be the cause. What's the pathology of what's going on in your body? Some illnesses are, don't just instantly show up, and some illnesses actually require some kind of experience externally, and so the doctor wants to know those things. So God calls us to sometimes retrace our steps to find something that we have lost or to redo something that we've left undone. Now, I know if you've been around church very long, you're probably already feeling anxious about this because doesn't God say, we're not supposed to go back. Don't go back. Don't go back. In fact, there's a great story in Scripture about this. You'll find it in Genesis 19 if you want to read it later. It's a story about Lot and his wife and his daughters and, and, and his sons-in-laws, and, and, and two angels came incognito to, to rescue them from the city of Sodom. The reason that they were there is because Sodom is about to be destroyed. And this is the kind of thing, I just listened to a lecture by an atheist, and, and this is the kind of thing that he just railed against. He just railed against. He, he, this is what he said. He said, there are so many things that go wrong in our world. God cannot be good and allow people to suffer the way that suffering occurs. And to all the crime and the injustice that happens, where is the goodness of God? And then he also talked about this God in the Old Testament is the God who comes down with judgment and wipes out an entire tribe of people, an entire city. What kind of God is that? And you know what I thought when I listened to him say that? I would say, you don't get to play both sides of that coin. How can you accuse God of not doing anything and saying he's a bad God and then accuse him of doing something and saying he's a bad God? Which do you want from this God? The truth is he just doesn't want a God at all. We always feel better if we think we can be God. That's a horrible mistake to make. So the city's about to be destroyed. The Bible tells us that there had been a great cry that had gone up to God because of what was going on in that city. And that wasn't the cry of religious people who were offended by what they saw. It was the cry of victims who were being constantly assaulted and taken advantage of and abused in that environment. It was unbelievably painful, unbelievably destructive, unbelievably unhealthy. It's the kind of thing that nightmares are made of. And finally, God cannot allow it to go on any longer, and he sends angels to rescue Lot and his family. And he tells them, flee the city and don't look back. But Lot's wife looked back. 
Why? We don't know. Was she just being defiant? There are some people, you know, that all you have to do is put up a sign that says, don't spit here. And you know what people will do? Yeah. They wouldn't have thought of it, but they, all they needed was a sign. Was she attached to something that she was leaving behind? Was it a lack of compassion and she wanted to see judgment come on a place that she had hatred for? Was, was it a curiosity? I wonder what judgment looks like. Was it a doubt? I don't think God will really do this. Was it a desire to return to something or someone who was there? We don't know, but we do know what happened to her as a result of her looking back. And that was she became a pillar of salt not a marble statue, but this pillar of salt. What happened to her? She found herself paralyzed between destruction and safety. And it was because there was something in her that desired to go back to something that God wanted her away from. Uh, even Jesus made reference to her, and he told people not to go back. And in fact, in Luke chapter 9, he's calling people to follow him, and they're giving him reasons, things that they have to take care of first. And, and, and Jesus actually says this. He says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. So why, why would we ever want to look back? If we're talking about looking back, isn't that a contradiction? And the answer is no. It's a paradox. And a paradox seems like a contradiction until you think about it for a minute. And so there's some things I'd like you to think about a little bit today. Jesus was warning us and those people that day, don't look for reasons to not serve, to not follow him. But we also have examples of scripture, like when the prophet Elijah was fleeing for his life, even though he had experienced some incredible victories. The queen, by the name of Jezebel, have you noticed nobody calls their daughters Jezebel anymore? She's the reason for that. And, uh, and, and she had put a threat out, a hit out on his life. And, and she made a promise. She wasn't going to eat until he was dead. And he takes off just, and, and he meets with God. And God says, I need you to go back the way you came because there's important work for you to do. You're going to have to retrace your steps. There are times and places where we have to go back because there are times and places where we have picked up a pattern or we've experienced a wound and we need to be freed and we need to be healed. We hear a voice inside of our head and sometimes we just think it's us talking to ourselves, but sometimes we have to go back and find out where did that voice come from? Whose voice is that? If we want to challenge the voice in our head, we need to know where the voice came from. Some of us think thoughts and we just think it's us thinking, where did you pick that thought up? And why has it been so often repeated in your head? And have you paid attention to how many things it kept you from experiencing or enjoying in life? The seeming contradiction is not a contradiction at all. Our sins can be forgiven, but that doesn't mean that the patterns we've learned are immediately eradicated from our lives. God brought the nation of Israel out of hundreds of years of slavery in Egypt. And while they came out of the land of slavery, slavery never got out of them. They thought like slaves, they talked like slaves, and they acted like slaves for the next 40 years. Failing to experience the good things that God wanted for them because there was a voice in their head they could not get rid of. Um, the truth is, is that we've all been handed down some patterns, some good and some flawed. Every family has some traditions that are life-giving and every family has some traditions that are life-draining. Our goal in looking back is to take responsibility, not to assign blame. 
So often when humans think back about where these things occurred, we just start pointing fingers of accusation against some family member. The truth is, is that they were repeating a pattern that had been handed down to them. The purpose is not to point a finger of accusation. The purpose is to take responsibility. The way we do this is to start looking behind the stories that, of our lives and the stories that we tell ourselves. Now, I hope you noticed something that sounded terribly unfair in the passage I read from Exodus, and that was that God said that he would punish the children up to three and four generations down the road for the sins of their parents. How many did notice when I read that? And when we listen to something like that, we say, well, that, that doesn't seem fair. The issue is not about how bad grandpa was. The issue is, have we picked up any of grandpa's patterns and are we living them out? There's a, a pastor in New York City by the name of Pete Scazzaro. He's the one that wrote the book Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, and this is what he said. Jesus may be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones. Yeah. Our family has had a profound influence on us. You say, not mine. I, I do the opposite of my family. Yep, they're still controlling you. Because all you have to do is see something that looks like them and you do the opposite, which is not exactly choosing the wise thing or the best thing, it's just choosing the opposite thing. The question is, what's healthy? What's helpful? What's holy? And that's what God wants us to think about. The word punish there actually means consequences in the original language. The consequences of a parent's sin can go to three or four generations. Children are experiencing the consequences because the patterns of that parent are being passed down. These patterns of a previous generation seem to embed themselves in future generations. And, and there's, a, there's a word for this or a phrase for this that you'll hear among Christians sometimes, and they call them generational sins. And it just, it, it, it's, there's not something mystical about it. It's just the thing that grandpa did is the thing that the son tends to do is the thing that the, the, the grandson tends to do is the thing that the great-grandson tends to do. And, and we can see this in the Bible because the Bible doesn't hide any of this. For example, God calls Abraham to begin a new nation in the world. But Abraham has a very interesting uh, and sordid story. Twice he lied about his wife saying it was his sister to protect himself. Just think about that. Denying his marital status because he was worried somebody might get rid of him to get to her. And so, so, well, what difference does that make? As it turns out, Abraham's son Isaac did the exact same thing. And his grandson would also lie about who he was. He pretended to be his brother to his blind father so he could get something from him that he knew he wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, and, and didn't Joseph's brothers lie about him? They sold him into slavery and then they told the father that some wild beast killed him in the wilderness. You see this when, when Isaac favored Esau over the other son, Jacob. Well, what happens with with his, with his son, his, his son Joseph, his grandson Joseph. Joseph does the, his brothers hate him because his father shows favoritism to him. They just get clothes from wherever, but Joseph gets the coat of many colors. And there's sibling rivalry. Isaac and Ishmael were after each other. Not surprisingly, the families that followed them, Jacob and Esau are after each other. Not surprisingly, Joseph and his brothers are after each other. We, we've all been taught something negative from the history of our families. But this is not what we learn from Jesus, which is why he calls us to be part of his family. He wants to teach us something else. He doesn't, we don't learn unhealthy things from him. We learn unhealthy things from other places. So what hope do we have of experiencing real change? Well, uh, we can make promises that we will not become like something, but we often wind up, wind up just repeating things that we have seen or been handed down to us. 
or we wind up becoming the things that we hate or the things that hurt us. So the, the question is, are we doomed to just continue this endless cycle of repetition? And the good news, the good news is God's grace not only covers our past, he also empowers us to experience a different future. Now don't get me wrong, if all he did was forgive our past, I'd follow him just for that. But that's not where he ends. We have a great and gracious God, and not only will he forgive us of our past, he wants to give us the future that he hoped and dreamed for us. Is there anybody in the house who thinks that's, that's a really good thing? Yeah? You think so? I think so. So, God has a way of working with people who has a broken past, and the Bible is filled with those kinds of stories. It's unflinching. Uh, the, the Bible doesn't varnish over anybody's past. Broken people are made whole, but always by a power outside of themselves. They don't just look in the mirror someday and tell themselves, I will be different. They look to God, and he helps them become something that's different. So we've been invited to follow Jesus. And this means that we have the option of being able to put off a negative legacy that's been handed down to us. The process is slow. That enables us to handle it. If God were to deal with everything we needed done in our lives today, do you think you could handle it? And the process is steady because God doesn't give up. So we're, we're invited to be part of the family of God, the family of Jesus. Now, patterns are behaviors that are repeated over and over. It's like a programming that we live out. You probably have experienced this. Everything is fine until it's not. All of a sudden, you find yourself responding in an angry way or lying about something unnecessarily, avoiding conversations with people, inability to forgive, where do we learn these things? How do we relearn something else? So these patterns just keep getting repeated over and over, and then trauma is a wound that we've experienced that hasn't healed, we haven't recovered from. There are things that should not have happened to us. There are things that should never happen to children, but they do. And sometimes we carry the wound of that our entire lives. And then there are scripts, things that we tell ourselves about ourselves. We tell ourselves, I can't ask for help. We tell ourselves, I need to hide my mistakes. We, need, we tell ourselves, I cannot be sad. We tell ourselves, I can't confront someone who's, who has done something that's wrong to me. Our scripts affect not only what we say, it also affects the things that we hear. When someone tries to give us feedback on how to improve, we don't hear their effort to make us better. What we hear is their rejection of us and pointing out a mistake that we have made. Sometimes we tell ourselves, it's my job to hold everything and everyone together. It's my job to make sure that no one is ever sad. It's my job to not get angry or confront anything. It's my job to keep the family together. And how many of us grew up with this idea? Anything that happens in the family stays in the family. Don't rock the boat. We're told our voice doesn't matter, our needs don't matter, that we are nothing but a failure. Don't show any weakness. Always put a smile on your face. Don't ask for help. Who gave us these scripts and why do we keep saying these things to ourselves? Go ahead and look through scripture and see if you can ever tell God, if you can ever see God telling people to talk like that. Small scripts can dominate our life responses. So God wants to give us a new script. The evil one would be perfectly content if you continue just repeating those same things over and over in your head to yourself. But God says our past does not have to determine our future because he wants to do something different right here, right now. So, we are made new in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's an old story in scripture, and uh, I, I don't have time to go into it very deeply. In fact, I'll call the worship team up now. But Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, and the reason is because he had dreams. They were prophetic. 
There's something future-oriented about them. And, and he foresaw in dreams that there would be times when his entire family would bow down and, and, and show reverence to him. And the brothers didn't like that, and so they sold him into slavery. Joseph still had the capacity to interpret dreams. Let me ask you, if something like that happened to you, and someone asked you what a dream meant, would you keep your mouth shut? Because that's how you got where you are right now. The day came when the dreams became reality. Joseph interpreted dreams even from prison. He finds himself second in command to Pharaoh himself. There's a famine in the land and his brothers wind up coming to Egypt to get supplies because they're going to starve without them. They don't recognize their brother who looks very much like an Egyptian and speaks to them in Egyptian. And when they see the second ranking person in the kingdom of Egypt, they bow down and they bow low. And what would Joseph do in this moment? Would he repeat the behavior that's been done to him? You made a slave out of me, I'll make a slave out of every one of you. I'll make your life miserable. He doesn't. Something else had happened. He had a different script inside of him. When his brothers realized who it was, they were terrified. And with tears streaming down his face and weeping so loud that it could be heard throughout the palace and the city, Joseph, in broken sobs to his brothers, said, What you intended for evil, God intended for good. That's a completely different, a completely different script. Have you allowed God to write scripts into your life like that? So that's the voice that you hear when you're facing things. Second Corinthians says this, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It could be this morning that what you need to move forward is to look back. Not to desire something from the past and not to avoid serving Jesus, but to find the moment that a voice was inserted or a pattern was inserted into your life and to look back and not only see where that came from, not to accuse, but to take responsibility, but secondly, to also look back and see what God has done for us. This is how God showed his love for us. He gave his one and only son to give his life on a cross. We can look back back and see the faithfulness of God, and that enables us to walk in a brand new future with God. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning.